about population models in TVB and the phase plane. It will give an intuitive introduction into population models in TVB and the elements of a phase plane. We will answer the questions, what is a population model? What is a phase plane? And we will use the stefanescu gilsa population model as an example of how population models can be constructed from spiking networks. This paper gives a general introduction into the virtual brain um, and population models in general. This publication gives a more in-depth treatment of the mathematics uh, behind the virtual brain, behind brain network modeling and population models used in TVB. And this publication um, gives an exhaustive overview over um, different approaches of how um, uh, spiking networks uh, can be reduced to neural masses or cortical field models. What is a population model? With brain network models we aim to simulate brains. Brains consist of neurons and form a complicated network of such neurons. In TBB we parcelate the brain into a set of brain regions and we compute the interregional coupling, the coupling between brain areas, using a technique called diffusion-weighted MRI, tractography. Together with the parcellation, this allows us to generate a brain network model that is specified by the weights um, of connection strengths between different brain regions and their distances, uh, which gives us an estimate of the time delay of interaction. We uh, saw that the brain consists of a complicated network of different cell types that are all interacting in a complicated manner. Population models aim to reduce the complexity of such a network by employing abstractions. For example, this complex graph can be made simpler by only distinguishing between two types of cells, excitatory and inhibitory, and grouping the cells uh, according to their function. Neurons of different function together into two groups, we can further simplify the system by expressing the dynamics of either of the two groups using a simplified model that describes the average or mean behavior of each of the two groups. Why can we use an abstract model like a population model in order to simulate the brain? We can do this because abstractions work. When simulating the brain, we are interested in macroscopic properties of the brain. We are not interested in the specific behavior of individual cells. As an example, consider a pot of boiling water. When removed from heat, it slowly cools down. If we now want to uh, measure the temperature of this pot of water, we could either sum up the kinetic energy of each water molecule. This would be an enormous task, which would require um, extensive computations. Alternatively, we could employ a very simple formula, Newton's law of cooling. It just depends on the surrounding temperature, the starting temperature, and the cooling constant, and the elapsed time. So a very simple formula that depends on um, uh, very few parameters and variables can um, give us an estimate of this macroscopic quantity temperature in the pot, um, which depends on macroscopic elements. But here the specific settings of individual mac microscopic elements is not important. What is important for the um, macroscopic behavior of the pot, the, its temperature, is uh, an average, uh, the average behavior of all these individual water molecules. And we do something similar when simulating brains. What is our motivation to generate population models? Our goal is to understand the dynamic behavior of neural networks. In order to do this, we need to employ simplifying assumptions. Neural networks, as we find them in human brains, are overwhelmingly complex. It would be impossible to get meaningful results from a 
simulation of an entire brain on the level of spiking neurons. There are so many degrees of freedom, there are so many um, parameters that cannot be measured. We um, would not get meaningful results of such a simulation and it cannot be constrained by empirical data. In order to reduce complexity, we employ the concept of a neurocomputational unit, which is a population of neurons that shows similar behavior. If a population of neurons shows a similar low-dimensional behavior, we can reduce their behavior or their description to this mean behavior and only show their mean behavior. And this gives us the building blocks to construct large-scale brain network models, neurocomputational units and their interconnections. Our goal is to reproduce typical complex neural network patterns or dynamics uh, like synchronization, multistability, clustering, oscillations, bursting, oscillator, oscillator tests, etc. <clears throat> with a low-dimensional system. Um, these complex dynamical patterns are commonly found in recordings of neural activity. And here we wish to reproduce them with a simplified low-dimensional system. <clears throat> For the dynamics of large-scale networks, the details of neuron type connectivity or spike timing are often irrelevant or, to be more precise, they can be lumped together. For example, the position on a dendrite, the dimension of a synaptic terminal, the receptor distribution, the type, all de determine the synaptic efficiency of a connection. All of these may then be absorbed in a simple coupling parameter. We could either devise a very complex model that takes into account all of these um, complex properties, like the 3D morphology of a dendrite, <clears throat> the size and morphology of synaptic terminals, the number of spines, and so on, the type of um, uh, the specific type of a receptor subclass, for example, and so on. All of these have uh, an influence on the connection strengths these neurons have. But we could also um, treat them by just a single parameter that just um, specifies this connection strength. So we absorb these different parameters in a simplified phenomenological parameter. <clears throat> uh, another motivation is that neural dynamics may live on a low dimensional manifold, which is a recurring observation in experimental data. For example, the cortical population activity uh, required to perform different kinds of motor behaviors can be mapped to a low-dimensional neural manifold that is largely preserved um, across different tasks. M1, the motor cortex, the primary motor cortex, performs a rich repertoire of motor behaviors and during each task we measure very different activity patterns in individual neurons. However, it was found that the structure and dynamics of the dominant neural covariance patterns is largely preserved across tasks. What does this mean? For example, we measure the activity of three different neurons, N1, N2, and N3. When we perform a, um, a mode decomposition technique, like for example a principal component analysis, we will find that the activity pattern collapses onto a lower dimensional manifold. So here in a three-dimensional space spanned by three neurons, we can collapse the activity of the neurons onto a two-dimensional plane. This is done by mode uh, te decomposition techniques like for example principal component analysis, um, which decomposes the data into uh, a set of um, of, of stereotypical activity patterns and a linear weighted combination of those. So this led the authors of this paper to the hypothesis that varied motor behaviors are actually caused by the flexible, flexible activation of different combinations of neural modes. So we have different low-dimensional um, functional units uh, that, are, um, that, that are flexibly combined in order to perform a rich repertoire of complicated motor behaviors. <clears throat> and the activity of each neuron is a weighted combination of the latent activities of uh, these uh, 
um, conserved um, dominant patterns of activity. What is the relationship between a brain network model and a population model? So a brain network model is the overarching model, uh, which we formulate in order to simulate the entire brain, while a population model is one component of this model. Population models are coupled together according to the weights and time delays which we estimate using diffusion-weighted MRI tractography. So from diffusion-weighted MRI tractography we extract uh, two metrics, um, represented here as two matrices, that quantify the strength of interaction and the time delay of interaction between different brain regions. And um, these are coupled to form a dynamical system, uh, which consists um, of coupled differential equations. So we have differential equations here. Uh, on the left hand side uh, we have the derivative, which uh, gives us the um, amount of change in a variable yi in an infinitesimally small um, time step dt. This variable yi could be uh, could represent all kinds of neural activities like firing rates, um, synaptic activities, membrane potentials and so on. Uh, the current state of um, this state variable yi is then plugged into this function f, which is our population model. So the population model computes um, the rate of change of its current activity depending on its current activity. So depending on the current activity, this um, function computes how the next time step will look like. And this depends on the current state, yi, but also on the current state or past state of all presynaptic um, population. So all, um, pop all brain regions um, from which we receive an input in our brain region i, um, the input is summed here um, to this function. So we have here another function g which takes as input uh, the weighted sum, the weighted and time delayed sum um, of all presynaptic inputs that our local population receives. So the sum depends on the connection strength, the time delay, and the current state yj of a presynaptic um, population, and is then added up. And finally, the last term is uh, in our brain network model equation is uh, this eta i um, at time t, which is a noise process um, to derive the population. So to summarize what a population model is, a population model is used to simulate the ensemble dynamics of a group of neurons. It consists of state variables and parameters. State variables, for example, represent average firing rates, synaptic gating, membrane potentials, etc. While parameters could represent the coupling weights and time delays of coupling, membrane excitabilities, synaptic gains, and so on. And we typically um, uh, discern between two different levels of description. So on the one hand, we have a rather qualitative description, uh, an abs uh, abstract or a phenomenological model, where the neural entities, the states and parameters, do not directly correspond to a biophysical quantity. So the unit of um, our state variable is not um, an SE unit like Ampere, for example, but it's a dimensionless system which uh, can be somehow mapped um, to, a, to a real system but gives more of a qualitative description of its activity. And then we have physiological or biophysical -physi models or biophysically oriented models where the states and the parameters uh, really aim to model a measured uh, biophysical quantity like a current across a membrane and so on and which is also expressed in this unit. Let's turn to the question, what is a phase space? And to answer this question, we will give a short primer on dynamical systems. What are the components of a dynamical system and how do we analyze it? Um, most of us are surely familiar with the time series representation of data. At the x-axis we have time and at the y-axis we have some time-dependent or time-changing process, like for example the membrane potential of a neuron. Um, below we see 
um, uh, at the y-axis now the change, the differential dv over dt, um, how this potential changes. So we can see, for example, um, at the beginning, there is a steep increase in the potential. So we have here a very positive value. So from infinitesimally small amount of time, dt uh, to dt uh, and so on, we see uh, an, an increase of the amplitude. The amplitude starts negative here and after a while it becomes positive. It increases all the time. So while this amplitude of the potential increases, we have um, a, po a positive derivative. Now we see here that the amplitude um, increase comes to a halt and um, it stops basically. So here at this position we see that our um, derivative or the, the quotient of the differentials goes to zero. It doesn't change here. Here's a plateau. And then the direction of change changes. Uh, the amplitude decreases again. So here uh, our derivative gets negative. So this is um, a representation of the left-hand side of our dynamical systems equations. Our goal is now to find a function that associates the current potential nu um, with its change, d nu over dt. So we want to find a function f that computes this rate of change, so that we can compute for each instant of time the rate of change of the potential nu um, in order to predict the evolution of this dynamical system. Let's look at another representation of this system. What we just saw was a time-based representation. The x-axis uh, represented time and the y-axis represented um, either the potential nu or the change in the potential nu uh, in an infinitesimally small time step dt. <clears throat> Now we chose a representation called state space that omits time. So no axis encodes time anymore. Instead, both axes encode either the state variable or the change in the state variable. Now our initial point in this trajectory um, was at minus 0.3 um, for the potential nu and at plus 0.3 for the change in the potential. So this is our initial coordinate. Now if we plot the time series as before, we see that the time series maps in, spa in state space onto an inward spiraling spiral. Uh, this blue line is called a trajectory in state space and uh, the point it um, approaches is called an equilibrium point or a fixed point or uh, an attractor. So we have different uh, kinds of geometrical objects in state space and there could for example be fixed points. Fixed points are attractive, um, but equilibria can also be repulsive, so they can um, push the state away from themselves. Let's look at another example. In the previous slide we saw a damped oscillation. The amplitude became weaker and weaker over time. This time we have a self-sustained oscillation, which means the amplitude stays constant over time. <clears throat> How does this look like in state space? So we start at a point um, yeah, roughly similar as before at minus 0.3 plus 0.3. And now we draw our self-sustained oscillation. This self-sustained oscillation maps to a closed trajectory, a closed circle in state space. This object in state space is called a limit cycle. In general, the state space of a dynamical system has the same dimensionality as the number of state variables. So if we have two state variables, we have a two-dimensional state space. If we have three, we have a three-dimensional state space, and so on. Um, the higher the number, uh, the higher the dimensionality of the state space, um, the more complicated uh, and chaotic can the dynamics uh, be. So um, in a two-dimensional state space, we typically have um, dynamical patterns like we saw before, self-sustained oscillations, damped oscillations, and so on. In a three-dimensional state space, um, when our state flows through all three dimensions, um, we can see more complicated um, dynamical patterns. For example, here we have this um, burst-like behavior. Um, and uh, here we can see um, a chaotic bursting where we don't have a fixed um, 
a fixed interspike interval, but rather these uh, chaotic interspike interval distribution, um, which uh, results from this three-dimensional flow in state space. So we have here um, uh, fast spiking oscillations uh, along the x, y plane and a slow recovery variable along the z-axis. As we have seen before, a uh, trajectory in state space can uh, converge to a stable equilibrium. Uh, in the time series representation, this just means that the amplitude approaches a certain value and stays at this value. Uh, in a phase portrait, we will now uh, a phase portrait now is a qualitative mapping of this dynamics. So in a phase portrait, we redraw the, the state space in a qualitative manner. We interpret the state space in a qualitative manner. We distinguish different dynamical regimes in this phase space in this state space, and this is our phase space. So um, in a phase portrait, we would indicate um, a stable equilibrium or fixed point as a filled circle with arrows um, pointing towards this filled circle. In contrast, an unstable equilibrium, uh, which um, uh, moves the state away from itself, will look in the time series representation like this. There is an amplitude that starts at a certain value and then it uh, moves away from this value. In the face portrait re representation, we will uh, show this as an uh, open circle with arrows pointing away from it. Here is a selection of geometrical objects that we find in phase space. So what we just saw was a node or fixed point, um, which we draw as a closed circle with arrows pointing towards the circle. And in the time series, this is a trajectory which approaches a certain value and stays there. A focus is a uh, uh, inward spiraling spiral, um, and this corresponds to a damped oscillation. A limit cycle is a self-sustained oscillation. We um, enter the limit cycle and then we stay um, at this specific amplitude. Uh, um, when we have at least three dimensions in our dynamical system, uh, we can generate chaotic uh, patterns, and these uh, cannot be classified as either of the before. Let's introduce further concepts from dynamical system theory. In order to do this, we'll look at another dynamical system. So here we have now uh, the equations for a two-dimensional dynamical system um, with the state variables x and y, which change over time. And um, here is uh, our state space now shown uh, not in dependence of uh, one state variable and its derivative, but instead now both axes of our state space correspond to one of the two state variables. So we have y, the y variable at the y axis and the x variable at the x axis. And um, we can see here we have uh, some sort of oscillation which converges uh, to a fixed point. So as we saw before, this corresponds to this kind of uh, inward spiraling spiral. So what we did before was drawing a single trajectory in, in state space. What we do now is we draw many trajectories in space, state space. So we draw trajectories for many different initial conditions. So um, if we start our system at many different points, we will get many different trajectories in state space. And um, this uh, representation is called a flow field. So here we see the flow of the system for every point in the system. So we get an intuitive and qualitative understanding uh, of, the, um, of the change of the system depending on where you start. Uh, and this is indicated by drawing um, these kinds of trajectories with uh, arrows. We also see that our system has um, a fixed point in the center. Um, as we can see that all arrows approach this center point. How can we find the fixed points of the dynamical system? Fixed point means that the dynamical system does not change. When the system is at this point, uh, it does not move away from it anymore. Um, and how can we achieve this? This is achieved if for this point x, y in our 2D example, both der derivatives, dx over dt and dy over dt, are zero. So if the right-hand sides of these equations yield zero, for a certain um, uh, value x, y, um, 
then we know that the system is at a fixed point. So how can we uh, find fixed points? Fixed points means we find the zero points of these two functions. And we find the zero points of these two functions by setting the right-hand sides of the two functions to zero, rearranging and solving them, and uh, this will give us uh, the fixed points. So for example, if we enter this one fixed point here, uh, at location 1, 1, we see instantly um, if x equals 1, then y will also equal 1. So this is a fixed point at this location, for example. In total, we find three fixed points. So uh, these three points basically satisfy uh, these two equations uh, and solve them for zero. Um, there is another interesting object in uh, state or phase spaces, and this is null clients. Uh, a null client is the set of all points where uh, either one of the derivatives is zero. So we have one null client for uh, our first equation, when uh, all points where dx over dt is zero, and we have a null client for um, uh, our second state variable, um, when dy over dt is zero. <clears throat> so for the y, y null client, we saw if we set um, dy over dt to zero um, and rearrange and solve the equation, uh, we see that we get a constant, basically, x equals one. So the y null client is just a straight vertical line, while the x null client, so if we set the right-hand side of the x state variable to zero, rearrange and solve the equation, we see that we get the equation for a, a curve, a straight line. So this is y equals uh, 2, um, the intercept, and minus uh, 1 multiplied with x is our slope. So here uh, we have a slope of minus 1, um, and this gives us the x null line. Um, so these two um, uh, lines are called null clines, and um, at each of them, uh, one of the derivatives uh, doesn't change or is, is zero. Um, which means that at their intersection, there must be a fixed point. So at the intersection of this null client, um, both derivatives are zero, so this is a fixed point. Let's introduce a last concept of dynamical systems theory, uh, bifurcation diagrams. In a bifurcation diagram, um, instead of before, uh, in state spaces or phase spaces where we had state variables at both axes, now we have at least at one axis a parameter. Um, so we vary a parameter and we draw into the plot um, or at another axis we draw the qualitative behavior of the system. So um, here we have parameters at both axes. Um, in this example uh, we look at uh, the qualitative behavior of water depending on the parameters temperature and pressure. Um, so depending on the temperature and the pressure, if we worry either or both, we see that water undergoes qualitative changes. So at a very low temperature, uh, water is typically in the form of ice. But now if we increase temperature, the ice will melt and um, it will uh, 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 go into water. It will, it, it will become fluid and water. Or um, if pressure is low enough, it might also become vapor. So a bifurcation diagram gives us an overview of the qualitative behavior of the system in dependence of its parameter settings. To conclude our short primer on dynamical systems, uh, with a short dictionary on the most important concepts. So we saw that state variables um, change in time. So they describe the evolution of a certain entity, like the speed of a car or um, the membrane potential of a neuron. <clears throat> in contrast, a parameter remains constant on a short time scale and is used to describe the structure of the dynamical system. So for example, the mass of a planet or the density of synaptic connections and so on. A differential equation now associates state variables and parameters, which is other. Which is other. Uh, a differential equation describes how a state variable changes as a function of its current state and the parameters. A phase space now is a geometric representation of the qualitative behavior of the system. So in a state space, um, 
the state space has the same dimensionality as our dynamical system, um, but we can still look at lower dimensional um, slices of this high dimensional state space, and it gives us a geometric representation of uh, the flow or the behavior of the system. While the flow is um, uh, the vector um, of change, the, the, the orientation and magnitude of change for each point um, in phase space. A trajectory or orbit is then a curve in this phase space that follows the system flow. So um, at each point in the phase space we can uh, draw such flow vectors and if we then um, uh, initialize the system at a certain condition and um, construct uh, a curve by following the flow at each point we end up with a tra trajectory or orbit. Then we have attractors in um, phase spaces which means um, that the flow always converges towards these um, objects and these can be fixed points, um, single points or they can be limit cycles. We can also have subtle points which means that um, from some directions um, the flow will approach this attractor but from in other directions or dimensions the um, flow will um, move away from this uh, point. So this is uh, very similar to a subtle um, of a horse where um, two, from two directions of the manifold we um, basically approach it and two directions uh, move away from the saddle point, the, the top point of the saddle. Um, Multi-stability and metastability are also important concepts um, which we just briefly mentioned here. <clears throat> Systems are multi-stable if there is more than one attractor, which means they have um, several stable solutions and they can switch uh, and, and move from one of the stable solutions to another one. Um, <clears throat> and subtle points can make a system metastable, which means we can have um, corridors in the dynamical system uh, where um, the system moves between different stable solutions in a metastable manner. As a final topic in this talk, now let's run a full example of how we can construct a population model, a neural mass model, um, um, using the Stefanescu Gilsa population model as an example. So in TVB, there is a choice of uh, local population models. Um, we can select them in the simulator cockpit or um, with a programmatic interface and um, we, we select basically a local model and then we can um, select or specify parameters of this local dynamic model. And Stefanakil Chilsa 2D and 3D um, are uh, among these local population models that you can use in TVB. Uh, the model was introduced in this paper by Stefanescu and Chilsa um, and basically uh, in the following we'll uh, walk through um, relevant concepts or um, paradigms used in this paper in order to simplify the dynamics or the, the equations that specify the dynamics of a spiking network to derive uh, a simplified representation a neural mass model or population model. The motivation for uh, constructing the stefanescu chilsa model was to reproduce the complex neural network dynamics like multi-stability, synchronization, clustering, oscillation, bursting and oscillator deaths with a low dimensional system. Um, and one um, um, a particular um, property of this study was that they studied the effect of parameter dispersion. Um, so the, the single neurons, the spiking neurons that were used in, um, to, to analyze the dynamics of the spiking network um, showed a distribution of parameters. So in previous attempts to formulate um, neural mass models or mean field models, um, the parameters of the single units, of the single neurons that um, were used to uh, derive the population model were identical. So each neuron had the same properties. Um, and in this study um, they varied the properties of the single neurons. So here the membrane excitability um, follows a uh, um, probability distribution, so there's not a single fixed value that is identical for each neuron. 
Instead, we study the effect of um, having uh, a more narrow or more broad distribution of these membrane excitability values. Um, so our recipe to construct a neural mass model is basically we set up a spiking network model um, and study the dynamic behavior of this network of neurons. And um, ideally, we find certain dominant patterns of behavior. So we find some mean behavior of this network of neuron, neurons that uh, we find important and we would like to model um, with a simplified model. And then we use mode decomposition or mean field, or we, we generate a mean field theory in order to derive a low dimensional representation of this um, high dimensional network's dynamics. Um, how exactly this is done um, uh, is not covered in this talk, but we will show or give an um, intuitive um, understanding of this process. What is the architecture of our spiking network? Uh, we use in the spiking network 90% um, excitatory neurons that are all to all connected and we use 10% inhibitory neurons which are only driven by excitatory neurons. Um, on this scale we ignore transmission delays um, as these are locally coupled neurons and um, we assume that the transmission is um, about as fast as a one time step of our um, integration um, schema for our differential equations. So, um, as mentioned before, uh, we try to model a local population of neurons, for example in this cubic uh, millimeter volume, um, and to simplify things we will then regroup the neurons into a group of excitatory and inhibitory neurons, and um, ultimately we would like to describe the interaction between these two groups of neurons, or these populations, um, using only three coupling parameters. So before we had um, a single coupling parameter between each neuron, uh, and now we want only uh, to have three coupling parameters that specify the coupling strengths from the excitatory to the inhibitory population, from the inhibitory to the excitatory population, and the recurrent excitation within the excitatory population. Um, we even reduce the number of parameters um, once more um, by um, setting uh, K21 and K11, the excitatory to inhibitory coupling and the recurrent excitatory coupling, to roughly the same value, and we only specify the fraction of um, K12, the inhibitory to excitatory coupling and the recurrent excitatory coupling, um, uh, and vary this fraction n. Um, of these two coupling parameters, which further reduces the number of parameters. Let's look at the two kinds of population models that are analyzed and reduced in the Stefanescu Chilsa paper. We have Fitzuna Guma neurons and Hindmarsh Rose spiking neurons um, that we will then couple to networks, study their network behavior, and reduce their network behavior to a set of simplified equations. Um, so both of these are um, more phenomenologically oriented models. So the state variable is x here. Um, so the Fitzuna Guma is a two-dimensional system. We have state variables x and y. And Hindmarsh Rose is a three-dimensional system. We have x, y, and z. Um, and these state variables, so the x state variable in both cases, um, models um, or attempts to model the um, ongoing membrane potential of the neuron um, but it's not expressed in uh, units of a potential um, but uh, it's a dimensionless variable um, so we don't have millivolt uh, units here but still the variable um, moves between a negative and a positive value um, much similar to the uh, membrane voltage of a uh, neuron. So um, these uh, equations and parameters, uh, here the first terms are not um, really relevant right now. Um, uh, let's focus on this last term. This last term in both, uh, in, in the first equations for the first state variable of both models, um, specifies external input or membrane excitability. So either uh, we could just sum up some um, input current, synaptic current that reaches uh, the 
that, that increases or decreases the membrane potential of our neurons here. Um, uh, or, as we mentioned before, um, these parameters could uh, actually represent many different things. So, in this case, we interpret it as a membrane excitability. So, the membrane excitability is the um, easiness with which a membrane can be excited, and um, this uh, corresponds to a value that we can just uh, sum or add to our um, membrane potential, basically. So, uh, neuron with a high membrane excitability will um, is more likely or will increase the membrane potential of uh, the neuron more than a model with a lower membrane excitability. So we just add this number here or here. Um, and when we study the behavior, the qualitative behavior of the system in dependence of the membrane excitability, we see that this parameter basically shifts uh, the position of the null client, the cubic null client um, of uh, the system. So here's the phase space of the system. Let's look at the phase space and look at trajectories in phase space for two different settings of this parameter i. So here we have a positive value of i with a positive membrane excitability and this leads to this sustained oscillation um, in our uh, time series representation. So a sustained oscillation in time series corresponds, as we saw earlier, to a limit cycle in phase space. So here we have this closed trajectory in phase space, which is oscillating. Um, this straight line from, um, from, from the top right corner down to the lower left corner uh, is a null client of the system. And um, here this um, cubic line here uh, is also a null client. Um, and uh, we see that if we change the value of the parameter i, so here we change it from plus 0.8 to minus 0.8, um, we can see that this null client shifts. And um, at the intersection of these two null clients, we get a fixed point, which means that um, the amplitude of the system in a time series representation after performing um, this single oscillation moves uh, to the fixed point and stays there. While uh, in the upper scenario um, we had a limit cycle here uh, which allowed the system to, um, to, to continue oscillating. In the hindmarsh rose neuron model this parameter i gives rise to more complicated dynamics. Um, so as a function of this parameter i, um, the model exhibits um, very different kinds of dynamics. For a value below 1.32, we have simple fixed point dynamics, as we had here for minus 0.8. Um, we see the system performs one or two oscillations, and then it um, enters a trajectory that ends up in the bazaar of attraction of a fixed point, which ultimately ends up in the fixed point. If we now increase this parameter, um, we see that um, our system um, exhibits spike burst behavior. So we have these spike bursts here and uh, slow recovery periods in between. We already saw um, how this looks like in a 3D uh, state space. When we increase uh, the parameter i even more, we end up in a caudic regime. So here now the inter spike intervals are um, very irregularly distributed um, and we have this very irregular behavior of spike bursts, individual spikes and so on. And if we increase this parameter even more uh, we end up with very simple oscillatory dynamics. So for the heidmarsh rose model, a 3D model, this parameter um, already has a considerable influence of the resulting qualitative behavior of the model. So here again we have a phase space representation of the hindmarsh rose neuron model. Uh, we have the uh, three dimensions x, y and z. And here we have trajectories in phase space. We saw this earlier. So um, uh, for um, i equal 2.3 uh, we get three quick spikes in succession and a slow recovery, for example. We can now also draw a bifurcation diagram um, for this parameter i. So at the x-axis we vary the parameter i and at the y-axis we draw the interspike intervals. So the interval between 
uh, each spike, basically. And we have seen that for low values of um, i, um, we typically get either um, uh, this one short interspike interval, and then for a long time uh, we get nothing. So there is a very short interspike interval and a very long interspike interval. So we have these two um, types of uh, behavior of the system, so to say. If we now increase this parameter um, and bring it over 2.3, as we can see here, the qualitative behavior of the system changes. Um, we, ha we have a third arm in the bifurcation diagram, so to say. Um, uh, the, the, um, the, the model performs a bifurcation, it splits up, the dynamics split up, so to say, um, into different qualitative regimes. And we see here that we have uh, another type of short interspike intervals, right? Um, we have this uh, very short interspike intervals in our burst, and we have this slightly longer interspike interval in our burst, and we have this very long interspike interval in our bursts. And we can see how when we increase i, this long interspike interval decreases a bit, so the spiking the spike bursts come more often. Um, and uh, if we increase even more, we can see that this gives rise again to a new uh, class of interspike intervals until uh, now, when we get above 2.92, everything becomes very chaotic. So now we don't have like two or three more or less fixed interspike intervals, but the interspike intervals uh, can be um, all over the place basically. So they can be anywhere in between here. And this is uh, what we then call a chaotic regime. So uh, we cannot really easily make sense of this. Um, uh, everything is possible, so to say. And again, if we increase this parameter further, um, above 3.4, we see that um, then suddenly the dynamics become very simple again. So now we have just a very uh, simple dynamics, simple oscillatory dynamics, and only a single, more or less, a single interspike interval, a very regular spiking, um, which then uh, becomes uh, uh, faster and faster with increasing i. So we see here how a bifurcation diagram gives a very simple and intuitive overview over the qualitative behavior of the system. Um, so at the y-axis here we could draw all kinds of um, measures that quantify the qualitative behavior of the system. Um, but here we chose in the spike intervals and this already gives us a nice overview of the behavior of the system. Now comes an important conceptual step. Uh, what we previously looked at were, were individual neurons, uncoupled individual neurons that uh, were just um, isolated, basically. They were not interacting with other neurons. Now we couple these neurons to form networks of neurons. Uh, this was not read, uh, uh, accounted for in the equations yet. So we have to modify our equations um, and add the influence of other neurons. How do we do this? Uh, we do this in a very a similar manner than we did before when we introduced the simplified uh, large-scale brain network model equations. So our change of neuron activity, um, the left-hand side, the, the differential or derivative, um, does not only depend on the local activity of the neuron anymore, but also on the summed input from all connected neurons. So now we sum up the input from connected neurons um, and uh, we may put it into some kind of coupling function that, um, or our dynamical system, which basically uh, uses this estimate of the input from connected neurons in order to compute the change um, of activity. So um, here above we again see the single uncoupled neuron equations, and now um, we make a system of uh, n1 plus n2 coupled excitatory and inhibitory neurons. So now instead of uh, uh, two equations, we now have n1 e x equations and n1 uh, y equations for the excitatory neurons, and we have n2 x equations and n2 y equations for the inhibitory neurons. So this index i1 um, and j2 uh, basically denotes um, uh, runs over each neuron, basically. Um, on the right hand side we see that um, the major um, 
um, terms are still there. So from this X equation, we still have this term C times what is in brackets here. And we also have our um, uh, membrane excitability term here. Um, the Y equations are identical in both cases um, for excitatory and inhibitory neurons. Um, what is different here is that we have this term, this additional term here, um, so in the excitatory neurons and in the inhibitory neurons, we get an additional term here that is summed up to the equations. And this is the input from connected neurons. So what inputs do we have? Uh, we have an all-to-all -all connection with excitatory neurons. Um, and in this case, we basically can model the input as um, more or less as the average sum of inputs um, that uh, we as, as the average membrane potential that we have in the whole network uh, minus the local potential. So this gives us uh, basically in an all-to-all all all, um, uh, network, um, this gives us an estimate of the input that we get from the rest of the network. Here we see that um, inputs are subtracted from this equation. So here we have our inhibitory inputs. This is the um, K12 coupling parameter, which specifies the strengths of coupling from inhibitory to excitatory neurons. And uh, we basically subtract this value, this inputs from our excitatory membrane potential, which makes sense because inhibitory neurons decrease the membrane potential of the postsynaptic neuron. Um, likewise, for inhibitory neurons, um, we have only their excitatory coupling. So inhibitory neurons are not coupled amongst themselves, they only get inputs from excitatory neurons. So we have here the coupling parameter K21, which specifies the strengths of excitatory to inhibitory coupling. And uh, in a similar way here, we compute the input um, as the difference between the average uh, membrane potential and the local membrane potential. So um, this is a specificity, uh, peculiarity of the um, standard school Jersa approach. Um, this model is, uh, is better suited to model the coupling of electrical gap junctions, basically. So um, in synaptic um, connections, is uh, we would look at the sum of inputs here, not at the average. Um, and here to model gap junctions, um, we use the average membrane potential. So this is just a side note um, to really explain these things would take us a lot more time um, but uh, just bear with me that um, essentially we simulate the input to uh, uh, one neuron as the sum of uh, inputs that we get from all connected neurons and this is basically what we do here. For the heidmarsh rose neuron we do the very same thing so we have three equations now um, which means we have now um, three equations for all excitatory neurons and three equations for all inhibitory neurons. So um, these are three times n1 equations and these are three times n2 equations, which is um, already a lot of equations. Um, so here uh, we see basically the same thing. The basic structure of the model equations remained identical um, and we just added um, at the first state variable, this coupling term, um, which specifies the input which comes from the um, the excitatory, the, the recurrent excitation of the excitatory pool and the inhibitory input from the inhibitory pool of neurons and uh, for inhibitory neurons the excitatory input. So here in both terms, we uh, in both cases we um, now changed our single neuron equations to a uh, uh, network equations. So now these equations specify the behavior of a network of neurons and not of single neurons anymore. So now let's study the dynamic behavior of uh, such a network of spiking neurons. In order to determine um, qualitative dynamical features that we would like to reproduce in our reduced population model. So to recapitulate we um, are considering a network of N1 excitatory and N2 inhibitory Fitzsimon-Naguma or um, heidmarsh rose neurons. Um, and these neurons are not identical, but they differ in their membrane excitability, I, I, um, where we use a normal distribution 
to draw from and we vary the spread of this distribution um, using one parameter in order to study the effect of um, uh, the, the uh, membrane, the different membrane excitabilities. And as noted before, uh, this parameter um, may absorb variability of different physiological properties. Uh, not only membrane excitability, but also things like receptor expression, expression levels, neuromodulation, pathologies, and so on, uh, can be absorbed in uh, similar parameters or in identical parameters which allows us to reduce the complexity of such a system. So instead of having a model that um, explicitly models uh, receptor expression levels, um, the effect of neuromodulation, um, or different um, uh, 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 membrane excitabilities, we absorb all of these features in a single parameter. Because the um, effect of these different physiological properties um, is comparable or can be um, simulated by uh, similar terms. Uh, so we have um, six parameters for coupling strengths and the mean and the standard deviation of the distribution of our membrane excitabilities II. Um, and already, already this number of parameters makes the analysis of the system dynamics quite difficult. So um, a six-dimensional space is already um, hard to visualize, for example, um, the results are hard to visualize, so um, we uh, reduce the complexity further by uh, neglecting a recurrent coupling between unitary neurons. We said this before, so um, K22 is set to zero. Um, then uh, we say recurrent and feedforward excitation are comparable, so both are the excitatory effect of the excitatory uh, neuron population, so um, we set them to be identical, and um, instead of varying um, K12 and K11, um, the inhibitory to excitatory coupling and the recurrent excitatory coupling individually, uh, we only vary the ratio, um, assuming that uh, this, the ratio of excitation to inhibition is more important than the specific settings of these parameters. Um, and we also assume that the, these distributions of membrane excitabilities for excitatory and inhibitory neurons is identical. Let's study the behavior of a Fitsu Naguno network um, that is dominantly excitatory. So our parameter n equals 0.3, which means, um, which means that k12 is larger than k11. So, um, uh, sorry. K11 is larger than K12, so n gets smaller than 1, uh, which means we have a higher um, excitatory coupling than inhibitory to excitatory coupling. And we find when we analyze the system that the dynamics uh, fall uh, or can be categorized into three categories or three dynamical regimes. Um, we have region 1 for a relatively low coupling values of K11 and K12, we find that activity falls into two clusters. We have on the one hand uh, large oscillations um, on a limit cycle in red, and we have small oscillations uh, around a fixed point in, in black. Um, in region 2, when we increase coupling, we find that more and more neurons from the uh, cluster, the fixed point cluster, um, gets recruited by the limit cycle cluster and gets synchronized, uh, and the two clusters get synchronized. In region 3, we see that activity reaches a stable fixed point, uh, which can be interpreted as oscillation deaths. Now let's look at a uh, dominantly inhibitory network. So now n equals 2.5, which means inhibition is about 2.5 uh, or is exactly two and a half times as strong as excitation. And uh, there we can distinguish four uh, different dynamical regimes. We have region one, which shows a bi-clustering, um, again, um, of large uh, oscillations on a limit cycle and smaller oscillations uh, on a fixed point. Um, we also find that now not all neurons are synchronized, but there is actually um, a phase divergence. <clears throat> we have region 3, again, oscillator deaths, um, two clusters, uh, 
and uh, both approach to fixed points. So we have um, one cluster which is in a very high activity state and another cluster which is in a, a low activity state. Um, in region 2 uh, we find that um, neurons switch between synchronous oscillations and two cluster regime uh, like in uh, region 1. So um, here we have on the one hand uh, synchronous oscillations, the black and the uh, red are, um, are uh, synchronized, they oscillate um, synchronously, um, while we also have, um, um, uh, 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 here we find that uh, the black cluster does not follow the activity, um, so we have uh, two clusters here that can be differentiated, that um, have partly similar but partly dissimilar activity. And in region 4 uh, we see that now all neurons are oscillating on limit cycles, um, all are performing large uh, oscillations on um, limit cycles, um, and here we find, find now several groups, um, several clusters that sometimes oscillate antiphasic um, or in phase, and where neurons also can uh, exhibit cluster hopping, which means they um, uh, leave one cluster and get attached to another cluster. What this means becomes more clear when we look at a phase space or state space plot um, of our system. So now we have here x and y at our axis, so um, the x and the y state variable. And uh, we also have our null clients drawn here in red and green. Um, and in blue and in green we see excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And here we see um, four time points in quick su succession. So this is um, uh, less than a millisecond apart, basically. Um, and uh, here we see three clusters of excitatory neurons. So in all three panels, we see that we have three clusters of excitatory neurons, and these oscillate in phase space, right? Um, they are oscillating on limit cycles, so there will be some kind of limit cycle um, around here, and these, this group of neurons basically um, stays uh, attached to each other. So each cluster um, is um, a, 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 a fixed uh, set of neurons that um, jointly oscillates on these limit cycles. Um, and uh, what we find is that sometimes neurons exchange the cluster, but apart from that, um, these clusters remain relatively stable and this already gives us an intuition on how we could reduce the complexity of the spiking network because what we see here is that actually the um, all of the many neurons um, can be uh, categorized um, by a relatively simple behavior so um, this the, uh, in the end we could describe the oscillation on this limit cycle um, only by describing the average oscillation of each of the clusters. So it's not really important, this, this variability around the cluster is not really important. Um, we can um, capture the main or the dominant, dominant patterns of activity um, of this spiking network by just um, simulating the mean activity of each of these three clusters and the inhibitory cluster. So uh, this gives us already an intuition um, about a way or for a mean field theory, basically. So we could basically generate or create the theory that the um, macroscopic or the mean behavior of a spiking network um, can be um, at least qualitatively uh, be modeled by such three clusters. So to repeat what we just said, um, these clusters, these three clusters of excitatory neurons oscillating on a limit cycle um, in the XY phase space can be interpreted as neurocomputational units. Um, these neurons in a cluster exhibit a sufficiently similar dynamic behavior to describe them by the movement of the cluster centers rather than their individual movements. Um, right? So we save a lot of computation, we can reduce a lot of these equations um, by just simulating cluster centers instead of individual neurons. Um, having realized this, um, now we can apply mathematical techniques in order to perform 
um, this um, reduction of complexity or to construct such a mean field theory. Um, in general, arbitrary mode decomposition techniques can be tried here or can be used for that. Um, but <clears throat> here we already um, have a functional interpretation. Um, we um, know that it might be desirable to, um, to divide our um, activity into these three modes of behavior um, because they correspond to characteristic classes in phase space. Um, so, um, and, and uh, a first analysis reveals actually that um, <clears throat> this behavior, this cluster, the, the, the cluster um, a neuron um, attaches to, depends on the value of its membrane excitability II. Um, neurons with a smaller II are less likely to be a member of a strong firing cluster <clears throat> and rather a member of a quiescent cluster. So basically what we can do here is we partition our neurons based on II into small, medium and high values and describe um, the average movement of the resulting clusters um, by simplified equations. So how would this look like when we uh, apply um, such a, um, a, a, a mean field or when we create such a mean field theory for our original Fitzunaguno system? Um, so again, our clusters are neurocommutational units, and we partition neurons based on um, II into small, medium, and high values, and this gives rise to a new set of equations, um, which have a very uh, similar structure, or basically almost identical structure, than um, the original network. Um, we still have uh, two equations for our excitatory and two equations for our inhibitory neurons, um, but now we don't have um, these two equations for each excitatory neuron or each inhibitory neuron, but now we have only three equations which describe the three um, excitatory uh, modes of activity, basically, the three clusters, and likewise for the inhibitory population. So our population activity is now simulated by this reduced set of equations, uh, which has a very similar structure. So we can see here basically um, the we, we basically have a new set of state variables, um, but the interrelation between the state variables, um, the logic is uh, stayed more or less the same. Um, basically, we need needed to fit some parameters. Um, um, so simply speaking, we um, introduced some parameters and fit these parameters in order to uh, reproduce the behavior of these three clusters, basically. Um, and uh, this gives rise to this reduced set of equations. And we can see that instead of uh, n times two equations, so if our uh, um, network uh, consists of 100 neurons, we would have 200 uh, equations. Uh, but here we only need um, two equations for the excitatory and two for the inhibitory population, um, which means two times two um, and times three. So each of these equations, this index i, runs from one to three. So these are the three modes, the three classes of activity. So we see that we could qualitatively reproduce the behavior of the system uh, with a simple set of 12 equations instead of um, hundreds or thousands, depending on the size of the original network. So how good does this work? Um, let's compare our bifurcation diagrams, which we just saw. So uh, this upper panel here are, again, bifurcation diagrams uh, that we just saw, which um, divide our activity into different dynamical regimes. Um, and here we have the same for the reduced system. And uh, what we see is basically that there is uh, a strong overlap, basically. So um, there might be uh, some small errors of location, basically, but uh, more or less uh, the error is very small and the qualitative behavior is nicely reproduced. Um, the same is true when we look at the uh, time series behavior. Uh, so when we uh, look at these different the time series of the different modes of our reduced system and the corresponding average um, uh, excitatory and inventory subpopulation activity, we see that the waveform of the resulting time series is very much comparable for all three modes, respectively clusters, um, we see a very um, similar waveform pattern.
The same is true for the more complex dynamics of the hindmarsh rose neural model. hindmarsh rose is able, as we saw earlier, to perform spike burst behavior, and we see that this spike burst behavior here in black was uh, qualitatively uh, reproduced. So um, we basically see that we can uh, recreate complex dynamics of spiky networks with a reduced set of equations, which reduces the computational demands for simulating such population models, uh, which are then coupled to form full brain network models, and which also reduces the degrees of freedom and number of parameters of such models, which makes it easier to constrain uh, those parameters with empirical data um, or to analyze their impact on behavior and to study these uh, models. Um, and with this slide, uh, we'll come to the end. And I would like to thank you for your attention and say goodbye.